Good morning. I want to welcome you each one to uh, Extra Bible Fellowship this morning. Those who are watching via local television or on our website or Vimeo or uh, on Facebook. We're so happy that you joined us for our Family Bible Hour this morning and we pray that God will bless you uh, through his word as we look at it together. We pray that you will be challenged and encouraged as a result of our time together in God's word. <clears throat> Over the last several days, we've had opportunity to reflect upon the post-resurrection ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. We started a small series of, of messages on, with Easter Sunday, and we looked about and learned about vital truths uh, that we learned from the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we've been looking since then at the post-resurrection ministry and appearances of the Lord Jesus. In our second message, we did look together at uh, the first, uh, one of the first appearances of the Lord Jesus after his resurrection. And this is when he walked with two of his disciples as they had left Jerusalem, downcast, sad, a little bit of fear, and, and wondering whether they had believed in vain who the Lord Jesus Christ was. And as they were walking from Jerusalem back to Emmaus, the Lord Jesus Christ joins that in, them in that walk, and he uh, really basically uh, told them from all the Old Testament scriptures the things concerning himself. And as they walked along, basically later that day, we looked at one of the first questions that Jesus asked after his uh, uh, resurrection from the dead, and that question was, why are you troubled? We're living in troubling days. And I think it was a very relevant question that the Lord Jesus asked the disciples that first evening, that very evening of his resurrection. Why are you troubled? If we really believe that the Lord Jesus Christ <clears throat> is our Lord and Savior, the things that are going on in the world today, the things that, that surround us, uh, this new normal that we're facing with, uh, with uh, uh, the... Uh, stay at home and, and our uh, uh, social distancing and, and those things. Life's so different for all of us. But we should not let these things trouble us. Last week, we looked together at another post-resurrection appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and this was eight days later. This was the following Sunday after his resurrection. And he met in that room again with the disciples and this time, I believe the focus of the question is, why has doubt arisen in your heart? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? And again, I think that as days pass, doubts arise in each one of our hearts. But these questions are important questions. Why are we troubled? Why do doubts arise in our heart? But we're going to look at another question this morning that may help us to even further understand and get get through this crisis that we're experiencing. Today we want to consider the question that Jesus specifically asked one of the disciples. And that question is, do you love me? There are other questions that the Lord Jesus Christ asked during his post-resurrection ministry. In fact, even the very uh, uh, day that he asked Peter, do you love me? He had already asked the, the disciples uh, a question. And that question was, do you have any fish? And that may seem like a really irrelevant question, but we're going to look at it a little bit this morning as well as we study God's word. And so as we consider this message, this message is probably, as far as the post-resurrection appearances are concerned, 
It, it's probably number seven in his appearances, but it's the third time that he appeared to the disciples as a large group, uh, not the uh, general uh, disciples, but those who were the spe specific chosen ones to be the apostles. And so as we look at this question this morning, the primary question, do you love me? We ask, do we really love the Lord Jesus Christ? Or have we left our first love? And that's why doubts arise. That's why our hearts are troubled. Do we really love the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we serving him and living the great commandment and the great commission? Are we following him? These are all questions I want us to, to ask ourselves this morning because they're things that are implied in this discourse that we have between the Lord Jesus and Peter by the Sea of Galilee. If you have your Bibles, would you open with me please to John chapter 21. And I would like to start reading sort of halfway through the story, but it's where the story picks up of Jesus speaking directly to Peter. And so I want to start reading with verse 15 and read down through verse 22. John chapter 21, verses 15 through 22. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by the, what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, But Lord, what about this one? Jesus said to him, If I will that he tarry, remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. These are strong words that the Lord Jesus speaks to Peter. But I think they're very important words that we need to consider together this morning. So let me give you just a little bit of background to where we're at now in the greater life of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we look at the greater life of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I mentioned this in the last message uh, a little bit, the greater ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, often we only think of the Lord Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry. But the reality is, we have in the greater life of Christ a time period that expands from eternity past through eternity future. We have, first of all, the pre-incarnate ministry, incarnate ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, which was from eternity past until the incarnation. During that period, from eternity past right through to the incarnation, we realize approximately 6,000 years of history. Jesus' ministry started out with creation. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1 that he created all things, and without him, not one thing was created that was created. And so we start the public ministry, or the, the pre incarnate ministry, the Lord Jesus, with his creative work. But we also see him throughout the Old Testament fulfilling different ministries. We see him as the angel of the Lord speaking. 
We see him as, as the eternal God, speaking and, and commanding and leading and choosing his people and his nation. And so we have the pre pre-incarnate ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. But also then we have the preparation of Christ. From the time of the incarnation, his birth, until he was about 30 years old, the Bible tells us, we have what we would call the preparation of Christ. From his birth, when he was born to the Virgin Mary, there in Bethlehem, right through until the time that he was baptized by John the baptizer, we have that time of preparation. That's a time where he lived a normal life in many respects, as any and every child. We find, though, that there were some, a few events that are recorded. For instance, when he was 12 years old, uh, when uh, Joseph and Mary went to Jerusalem, as they did every year for one of the yearly feasts, they, uh, they went there and, and Jesus was with them. And when they started to return back to Nazareth, they, they had gone a long ways before they realized that Jesus was not with them. And when they checked with all those who were traveling together, family members and all, they found out that none of them had seen Jesus. And so they go back into Jerusalem to find him. And when they get to Jerusalem, they find him astounding the religious leaders as he was again uh, asking them questions and speaking to them. After his years of preparation, those 30 years, we have then what is called the public ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. For three and a half years, the Lord Jesus Christ publicly ministered to those throughout the land of Israel. We had, first of all, the year of obscurity. This is where the, for the time, from the time John baptized him and introduced him to the world as the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Right through uh, those first years as, as he was making himself known uh, in, in the land. The second year, which was really almost a year and a half, is called the year of popularity. And that's most of that year was spent in the, in, in the Galilees. And there he was doing some of the great, great miracles that he performed, healing and, and so on. And then the third year was the year of opposition. Because of the, what, uh, uh, the miracles that he did uh, in identifying him, there was opposition, especially from the religious leaders. And as a result, they were opposed and, and they were doing everything to find some occasion against him. Following that year of opposition, we have what we know as the passion ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. That which started Palm Sunday, what we call Palm Sunday today, and went through Easter Sunday. And every day we have recorded of that week, the events, and where he was at in and around Jerusalem. From Passion Sunday, what we call Palm Sunday, uh, the time that he, he uh, was introduced really to the world as, as king. But he was rejected by the end of the week. Following his Passion ministry, which ended uh, with his resurrection, but the last part of that week we have the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when that week was ended and, and the resurrection then he began to appear to his disciples. And that, that uh, post-resurrection ministry, the Lord Jesus, we do not know exactly how many times he appeared to different people. We do can go through and trace some of them. And to do that, we have to look at the Gospels, even Acts chapter 1 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And as we go through and find, uh, I believe that there were at least 10 recorded post-resurrection appearances of the Lord Jesus Christ in his post-resurrection ministry. And this chart, it may be a little bit difficult to, to see, but you'll find that on the very first day, he appeared, first of all, to Mary Magdalene. In John chapter 20, verses 11 through 18, it talks about that appearance. His second appearance was, was later on to Mary, uh, to Salome, to Joanna, and at least other... So, probably some other women there as well. And then he appeared to Peter. And finally, uh, there after he appeared to Peter, we find out that, that he appeared to what I believe is Clophus and Mary, his aunt and uncle. And they were on 
their way home from Jerusalem, and we talked about this two weeks ago, the Emmaus Road. The next appearance was also on Resurrection Sunday because as soon as Jesus vanished, when, when they recognized him through the breaking of bread, uh, they immediately, when, when Jesus vanished from their presence, they headed back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples that they had seen the Lord Jesus Christ and indeed that he had been raised from the dead. And so as, he, as they got back to the city, we find out that they met with the disciples in an upper room and the disciples and, and other women uh, were, were gathered together and, and they were afraid. And the Lord Jesus, through closed doors, walks into that room and appears to them and he asks them those two questions that we've looked at over the last two weeks. Why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your heart? Now Thomas wasn't with them. And so we dealt with Thomas last week and felt that Thomas got a bad rap. But we also realized that, that all the disciples that very first uh, resurrection day had their doubts. And so let's don't just pick on Thomas. Let's remember the good things that we learned last week about Thomas and how important he is to our understanding of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, after Resurrection Sunday, it was a week later that he appeared to the disciples again in that same room, and this time Thomas was present. And the Lord Jesus went to Thomas immediately, and he said, Thomas, put your hand here. You know, and he said, uh, uh, then he pronounced a blessing upon us, even the day. Blessed are those who have not seen. And so though we have not seen with our physical eyes the Lord Jesus Christ, we are blessed because we, through the eye of faith, recognize and understand who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. And so as we go through, we find out, we don't know how much, how many days afterwards, but we come to another appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ and it says, he appeared to the disciples by the sea. And this time, if you read or earlier in John chapter 21, uh, in verse 14, it says this was the third time that he'd shown himself alive, uh, uh, himself to his disciples uh, after his resurrection. And I believe that this third time is referencing the fact that, that though he had appeared to individuals, this is the third time he had had appeared to the disciples in, in a collective group. Uh, we realize that the first time he appeared uh, to them in that upper room on Resurrection Sunday, there were only 10 of the 12 that were there. Uh, Judas was absent for obvious reasons because of his betrayal of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and uh, the sorrow that he had experienced as a result of that. But uh, later on, he uh, uh, went out and hanged himself, as the scriptures tell us. We also know that the second time that he appeared to them as a group was on that uh, week after the resurrection. This time, there were 11 of the 12 present. And so he appeared to them as a group. Thomas there and Thomas's doubt, as well as the other disciples' doubts, settled once for all. This is the third time now. He had told the disciples that he would see them in Galilee. And so now they're in Galilee. They had gone back. We don't know how long, how long they had been there, but there was uncertainty. And so the disciples that were there together, one evening, Peter said, I'm going fishing. And six other of the disciples said, we'll go with you. Now we know that for several of the disciples, this was their occupation before they, be, they gave up their nets and their, their boats and, and went to follow Jesus. But while they were waiting, they went back to that which was sort of natural for them. They went back to fishing. And so the Lord Jesus now appears to them. And so I want to look at this with you. The appearance of Jesus to the disciples at the Sea of Galilee. In verses 1 through 3, in verses 1 through 3, we read that after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, that's another name for the Sea of Galilee, 
And the reason it's called Sea of Tiberias is because Tiberias was the, the major city that was right on the coast of this sea and often referred to as the Sea of Tiberias. And it says, and in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel, king of Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But the next morning, when the next morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to the children, Have you any food? And they said to him, No. Now, as I've read through these verses, we, we have the setting here. They were in Galilee. They, uh, they were gathered together. Uh, we don't know where the other uh, 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 three disciples might have been at this time, or four disciples. But we do know the fact that, that they were comfortable. This was home to them. This is, this is where they, they had lived their life. This is where they had cared for their families up to this point. They were fishermen. And so... Peter makes a statement that he's going fishing. And the other six disciples with him said, we're going to go also. And so by the time you get to verse 3, the end of verse 3, we find out that basically they had wasted a night. When they said, we're going to go with you, uh, they immediately got in a boat, and that night they caught nothing. Now, I can really identify with the disciples uh, I, I used to love to fish, but no matter who I fish with, they always outfished me. I fish with my wife, she'd catch a fish, I wouldn't. I fish with my friends up in northern Ontario, we'd go out, they'd be catching fish, I would catch nothing. We'd switch sides of the boat, they'd catch fish, I'd catch nothing. Switch ends of the boat, they'd catch fish, I'd catch nothing. I can identify with, the, with these disciples. And, and remember, these disciples, had uh, they were seasoned fishermen. But they had fished all night. And what does it say again? They caught nothing. Not a fish all night long. And then we have, after we, 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 we see this, this little bit of, of setting here, we find out next the question of Jesus and the instruction to the disciples. In verses 4 through 14, and we read the first couple of these, when, the, when Jesus there the next morning, he got to the Sea of Galilee, and it, it tells us that, that uh, Jesus stood on the shore. The disciples didn't know who it was. They weren't too far off the shore, but, but they couldn't recognize. And again, remember, Jesus in his post-resurrection body uh, uh, it was a body, that, but it wasn't like any body that, that we've ever experienced. He could walk through a closed door. He could, could uh, uh, disguise his, his appearance so that they did not recognize him as he did to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. So they did not recognize the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was there, and, and the disciples didn't know that, but he said to them, my little children. He's speaking to them now as 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 not just his disciples, but those who were in that family relationship with him because they had been followers and believers. And he said, my little children, do you have any food? Now this was typical of that day and on the Sea of Galilee, fishermen would go out in the, in the late hours of the night and fish through the early hours of the morning and people uh, real early uh, by breakfast time would come out to the seashore and, and if they saw a fishing boat uh, just offshore, they, they would holler out, got any food, got any fish? Because that's a staple of, of their diet there. And, and of course, they answered him and they said, no. Then Jesus said to them, Verse 6, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. Now, again, I find this interesting. Uh, uh, he didn't say, uh, cast your, your net on the other side of the boat. He said, cast your net on the right side of the boat. Now, I don't know if that word right can mean the opposite of left, or if that word right means, smart enough, guys, cast it on the right side, where the fish are. 
But they responded anyhow, and it says, and, and this surprises me because as a stubborn fisherman, uh, you know, you know where the fish are, but they immediately obeyed. They didn't say, well, who's this guy? He's asking us if we got any food. Now he's telling us how to fish. But the reality is they did. So they cast, and it says they were now not able to draw it in because of the multitude of the fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, this would be, be uh, uh, John the Apostle, said to Peter, it's the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he removed it, and he jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with them. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, fish laid on it, and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And all there, although there were so many, the net was not broken. And Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. And this is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. And so again, as we look at this, morning had come. The Lord Jesus stood on the shore, but his disciples didn't recognize him, didn't know it was him. And then the disciple, Jesus asked if they had any food, and when they said no, Jesus instructs them to cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'd find some. And sure enough, the disciples obeyed and were not able to draw the multitude of fish into the boat. They were big fish, and, and the, the, the word here uh, emphasizes that. These were, these were large fish that they caught, 153. And, and so immediately John said to Peter, it's the Lord. And so Peter, being the impetuous guy that we know him to be, what did he do? He grabbed his outer garment, his, his, his cloak, and he put it on, and he jumped in the water and headed toward shore because it was not that far off of shore. And so the other disciples came to, to shore, and it says, dragging the net full of fish. Uh, so it was, it was full, and it was heavy. And when they get arrived at shore, what they see? They saw a fire of coals. They saw fish on it. They saw bread. And Jesus said, bring some of the fish that you've caught. And here we go with good old Peter again. Peter by himself goes and grabs hold of that net and drags it ashore. 153 large fish. But the net didn't break. You know, there's really a number of miracles in this story if you'd stop and, and think about it, uh, the way it's emphasized here. Uh, all of a sudden, a, 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 coal, coal, a, a, a fire of coals, a fish on it already, uh, you know, uh, having to drag the net, and it was work for, the, for a, a boat uh, of six guys to do, yet Peter drags the net ashore by himself. They bring some of the fish, and then the Lord Jesus took the bread. And uh, the disciples, uh, when they took, took the bread, uh, they didn't say, uh, by the way, who are you, guy? Uh, they, they, they knew it was the Lord because the Lord, uh, again, I believe through the breaking of bread, though it doesn't talk about breaking of bread here, but through that act that took them back to the very night that Jesus was betrayed, that made an impact on the disciples when Jesus had told them that he would not eat that bread again with them again until he did it in the kingdom when he gave thanks and when he broke it. And today, we are privileged as believers to do what Jesus commanded his disciples that very last night before his death. This do in remembrance of me. And we're to do it till he comes. Again, often, I believe, we let it become ritual. 
we don't realize how important it is for our spiritual lives, but also to the Lord Jesus, that we have that weekly remembrance of Him. And I think one of the hardest parts for many of us during this pandemic is that we can't gather as much as we we enjoy that and enjoy fellowship one with another. But we can't gather to break bread, to remember Him as He commanded us. I look forward to the day, hopefully in the near future, where we'll be able to gather again together to remember Him. But let's continue with the story here. We read here that that He fed the disciples. They they ate there that day. and, And after they had eaten breakfast... All right. So now we have the seven disciples and Jesus. They had eaten. They were convinced. They knew it was the Lord. The Lord Jesus turned to Peter. And I I can just imagine the eyes of the Lord Jesus as they, they penetrated Peter's heart. And he said, Peter, do you love me more than these? And so... The questions of Jesus to Peter. He asked this question three times. They're not identical questions because words change in the question. But the point is very clearly made as he speaks to Peter. The first question, immediate after breakfast, Jesus looks into the eye. His eyes penetrate Peter's heart. And he says, Peter, do you love me more than these? The question is, who are the these or what are the these? Well, I've always in the past been very strong in saying the these is referring to the fish. Peter, do you love me more than these fish? This has been your livelihood. This is the way you provide for your family. This, Peter, has has been so important to you. Do you love me more than these? So let me ask you. Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ more than you love your job? Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ more than you love what, what, what He has enabled you to do to provide for your family? Or is he your first love? That's a question. And that's a question that he's asking Peter. Now, that's the view I've always held. And I, and I haven't changed on that. But I'm, I, I'm adding to that. Though the Lord Jesus Christ never specifically compares my love for him to your love for him. Because love is very personal. Love's very intimate. Love's between me and Jesus. Love's between you and Jesus. And and how do I know whether I love him more than you do if we tried to measure it? But I remember the words of Peter when Jesus told, uh, uh, when Peter made made a, a, a great confession, he said, Lord, I don't care if they all deny you, I will not. Maybe there was a little reminder here, Peter, uh, they didn't deny me, but you did. Do you really love me as much as you thought you did? And so it's not a direct comparison, but it is where Jesus hears what we say. And I believe Peter was serious. I mean, that very night, uh, just minutes or hours before Peter betrays or denies the Lord Jesus Christ. He proved that he, he is willing to fight for Jesus. He took his sword out and he hit the, the, the smote the, the ear of the, of the soldier and Jesus immediately put it back on and told Peter, put his sword up. Peter was serious. Peter said, in essence, Lord, Lord I love you. I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to die for you. But then he denied the Lord Jesus So Jesus is asking him, Peter, do you really love me? And when he asks that question, he says, Peter, are you willing to give it all up for me? This word love that Jesus uses is the word uh, that's very clear. It's the agape love. 
It's a love that's willing to give of self in order to serve another. Peter, are you willing? Are you really willing? And Peter's answer to that question was, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But Peter's answer was a different word for love. Peter's word here was, Lord, you know that I have a great fondness of you, for you. You know that I count you as my dearest friend. You know that, that uh, uh, Jesus said that I love you in this way. And then Jesus responds, Peter, if you love me, you're going to serve me. Feed my lambs. And then we have the second question. Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? Notice the question is a little bit different. It doesn't say, do you love me more than these? Now he's dealing face to face, heart to heart with Peter. Peter, do you love me? Are you willing to give it all up for me? And what was Peter's response to the same question? Lord, you know that I love you. Lord, I've got that great fondness for you. You're my best friend. I love you, Lord. And Jesus' response, feed or tend my sheep. And then a third time, Jesus asked Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? And this time, Jesus changes a word to the same word Peter had been using. Peter, do you really have that great fondness for me? Do you really count me as your best friend? Am I that friend to you that sticks closer than a brother? Peter's answer. And Peter was grieved. He was upset. And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Peter says, Lord, yes, you are my dearest friend. You are the one that I count closer than a brother. And so Jesus then tells to him, Peter, feed my sheep. So after that, Jesus then speaks to Peter about the cost that it's going to cost Peter. Because remember, if we're going to truly serve the Lord, if we really love the Lord, even with that phileo love, it's going to cost us. And so he says to him, Jesus uh, 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 said, uh, charges Peter. And he said, Peter, you used to just take care of yourself. When you were younger, you went where you wanted to, you walked where you wished, you, uh, you did what you, yeah, whatever. But Peter, when you get old, they're going to, to stretch out your hands and another's going to gird you and they're going to carry you where you do not want to go. And he was speaking about Peter's death. And we know that Peter died a horrible death. But when he had spoken this, sad to say, Peter's focus again. When, he had, when Jesus had told him this, when Peter turned around, what did he see? He saw that other disciple. He saw John. And he said, well, what about him, Lord? And Jesus spoke to him. And so that, that, that's Peter's response to the Lord, or question to the Lord. What about him? And I can tell you, when Peter asked that question, I'm sure that the Lord sort of ducked his head, shook his head, and he said, Peter, what's that to you? You've got your hands full taking care of yourself and obedient, obedient, being obedient to me. Peter, you follow me. And I think so often we're more concerned about how other people are serving the Lord than how we're serving the Lord. And the Lord Jesus wants to remind us with the very first words he spoke to Peter and the very some of the very last words he spoke to Peter. Follow me. When he called Peter, he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And here at the end, before the Lord Jesus ascends into heaven, he says to Peter, Peter, you 
follow me. So let me very quickly wrap this up. By way of conclusion, remember, the heart of the matter is always a matter of the heart. So let's get to the heart of the matter right now. To do so, I want to give you a quick summary of Peter's life. You know, I think we all identify with Peter because Peter, some say he's had hoof and mouth disease. He always had his foot in his mouth. Only time it wasn't there when he's taken it out to change feet. But well, the, the important thing for us is that we learn some great lessons from Peter. And though maybe Peter is branded like Thomas was, Thomas was branded as Doubting Thomas. Peter maybe has been, been branded as, as the, the man that was so impetuous. He was always in trouble. But let's look at this. I'll go through it quickly. We have, first of all, the call of Peter. And that call was, follow me. Then we have the cost for Peter. He told Peter, count the cost. He had told all of his disciples to count the cost. And again, I would encourage you to do a study on the cost of being a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christianity has been shortchanged in my generation of, of preachers and Bible teachers because basically... Uh, Christianity has come to the point where it's easy believism, uh, seeker, seeker friendly. And it's not about cost. It's about what do I get out of this? It's about benefit. Well, I want to tell you, we've got benefits out of this world. But there is a cost. If we're going to be a true follower of the Lord Jesus, count the cost. And then the claims of Peter. Peter had made some pretty strong claims. Peter had claimed that though all the others uh, uh, might deny the Lord, he would not. And so as we, we look at this and consider this, we, we find out that, that Peter said, I won't deny you. Peter said, I will lay down my life for you. Well, Peter did deny the Lord, but he's been reinstated. Peter did approve that he would die for the Lord, though he had not yet had to die for the Lord. And so he made some claims. Then we have the conduct of Peter. What really got Peter in trouble? If you read, it says, he followed at a distance. You know, I think that's where a lot of us as Christians today get in trouble. We say we love Jesus. We say that we're followers of Jesus. But I think we're following at a distance. We need to be following him close. And that's the charge, I believe, that we can learn from Peter's conduct. Don't follow at a distance. Follow close. And then we have the commissioning of Peter. Here, we find out that, that Peter was commissioned. Peter, I'm not done with you. Yeah, there have been failures. There have been shortcomings. You don't feel that you can love me with that agape love. But Peter, I can tell you right now, I have work for you to do. And for every one of us, God has work for us to do. The Lord Jesus, by His Spirit, has gifted every one of us to serve the Lord. Peter's serving was going to be to open up with the gospel from not only to, not only to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. Peter's work then would be to, to feed the children spiritual food, to tend the sheep, to feed all of the sheep. And so he is commissioned to this work. And then we have the confidence of Peter. When you get to the book of Acts, a little bit later on in the life of Peter, you find out in Acts chapter, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, in uh, Luke 24 and, and uh, 22 and, and Matthew 26 and, and later on, uh, in, in, in the scriptures that Peter uh, followed his commission and his confidence in Acts chapter 12. It says that Peter followed and was certain. He was convinced he was following the right one. He was following the Lord Jesus Christ. And no longer at a distance, there was that certainty, that confidence that Peter had that enabled him to go to the Gentiles, that equipped him to write the epistles and to teach all believers. And then the last thing we see, the counsel of Peter. 
If you read the books of First and Second Peter, and here at the chapel just a few weeks ago, we finished uh, First and Second Peter in our in our midweek Bible study, and what a precious time it was. But one of the things that we saw in there, Peter's counsel to all those who would read his uh, the epistles that that he uh, was inspired to write, was follow his steps, not Peter's steps, the steps of the Lord Jesus Christ. Follow Him. And could I summarize the Christian life? You've got to be a Christian to live the Christian life. And you become a Christian by believing the Lord Jesus Christ, His death for your sins, His burial, and His resurrection so we can be justified before God. But we read uh, as, as we go through, the Christian life is follow me. That's the way it should start and that's the way it should end. Uh, still following the Lord Jesus. So, just some lessons to learn. And I close with this very quickly. Lessons to learn. First of all, have you ever asked yourself, do you really love Jesus? Do some heart searching. Have you, felt, have you left your first love? The church at Ephesus did. Have you as a believer, are you more concerned about what others are doing for the Lord? than what you're doing for Him. Sorry, I misspelled the Lord there. Don't know how I could do that, but uh, I did. But basically, each one of us have our hands full doing what He's called us to do. We need to pray for our brothers and sisters that they will be obedient too. But we have our hands full being obedient to what He's called us to do. Let's pray. Father, again, we are so grateful for your great love for us that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Father, we're thankful for the death of our Savior. It's through that death that the redemption price was paid and we were redeemed not with things that are temporal, but things that are eternal. With the precious blood of Christ, who was a lamb without spot and without blemish. We thank you for that shed blood that purchases our redemption. But Father, we thank you that the resurrection guarantees that the purchase price met your holy and righteous demands. And Father, we can stand boldly today declaring this great good news, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And he was seen. Father, we have been looking at those, some of those appearances. And Father, now through the eye of faith, we see him as a risen Lord, seated at your right hand, where he ever lives to make intercession for us. We're blessed to know him, and we're privileged to, to make him known. So we thank you again for these times together in your precious word. Father, again, if there's one who's listening today that has never received that free gift of eternal life, they have never received the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, would you draw some to their, someone to their side, someone to the, to, that they have confidence in that they could talk to, and Father, that they could be explained even more clearly the way of salvation. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.